And hello, everyone. I'm State Senator Jeremy Moss, and I want to welcome you to our virtual press conference to roll out our legislation to expand the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act. And first, I immediately want to introduce our governor of the state of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, who time and time again has proudly earned her title as a chief ally to our LGBTQ community here in Michigan. She fiercely stood up for us on the state Senate floor when it was not the most politically popular thing to do. And I think we forget how underwater these issues are and were in terms of broad support uh, at the time, making it even more meaningful to have then Senator Whitmer by our side. And as Governor Whitmer, she immediately used her authority to secure anti-discrimination protections for LGBTQ state employment. On the first week of her administration, when we welcomed her into my district, which probably has the highest per capita LGBTQ population in the state, where she signed that executive directive on week one of her administration. So it is an honor for me to introduce Governor Gretchen Whitmer to kick things off. All right, thank you, Senator Moss. Uh, I am just glad to be here with all of you. I appreciate your introduction and Senator Moss, your leadership in the state Senate as a sponsor of this bill, but on so many fronts. And I also wanna recognize Representative Lori Pohutsky, who is the house sponsor of the bill and who has been a warrior in the house. Um, so I am I'm grateful to be here with all of you. And of course, my friend Janice Poindexter and Erin Knott and Sarah Werbelow, mm -hmm. glad to be with all of you and celebrating International Women's Day. So. Welcome to you, Jeremy, for joining all of us. Um, <laughs> I wanna thank everyone with us today for their ongoing dedication and hard work toward expanding and protecting equal rights here in Michigan. In the year 2021, nobody should be discriminated against based on who they love or how they identify. Although our country and our state have come a long way on issues of LGBTQ plus rights and discrimination, there are still gaps in the law this bill to amend Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act addresses those gaps and protects Michiganders against discrimination based on several factors, including sexual orientation and gender identity. With this bill, Michigan has the opportunity to become a model of equality. Every step we take toward enshrining protections on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation will impact Michiganders for generations to come and to make our state more competitive and welcoming, and to show that we are committed to walking on the right side of history. From day one, I've been committed to setting as, as an example, um, and I am proud of the fact that my administration is the most diverse in recent history. And as Senator Moss mentioned, one of the first things I did was sign LGBTQ protections and to law for, for state government employees, but we wanna expand that to every person in our state. Our diversity is one of our greatest strengths and that diversity needs to be protected under state law. If we're gonna attract the talented workforce, our businesses need to create jobs and grow our economy. We need to continue making Michigan a state where everyone can come to for opportunity and know they will be respected and protected under our laws. If we embrace diversity and support equal rights for all, Michigan will be a place where people come to live, work and play for generations to come. And we're all here because we wanna build a stronger, more inclusive Michigan. So I, for one, am absolutely continue to be committed to working with everyone to protect LGBTQ rights in our state. One where everyone, no matter who they love, can get ahead. That means coming together to break down barriers facing the community. Because it's not enough to say you're an ally. You have to prove it through your action and legislation that will make a real difference in people's lives. And you know what? Michiganders agree. A majority of people support the elements laid out in these bills. And it's an incredible sign of unity on this issue. This year's bill to amend Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act is bipartisan for the first time ever. Just last month, the House of Representatives passed the Equality Act with a bipartisan majority as well. There are signs of progress. Fighting discrimination has some parallels to other crises that we're facing right now, like the pandemic. As we know, with COVID, there are several things we can do to keep ourselves and our families and our communities safe. Wear masks, socially distance, washing our hands, quarantine when we're sick or have been exposed. We now have three safe, effective vaccines, all miracles of science, two of which have roots here in Michigan. And when it comes to discrimination, there are things we can all do in our daily lives. 
Call out words and actions that are discriminatory. Be good allies. Listen to the experiences of members in the LGBTQ plus community. And our vaccine for, dis for discrimination, the vaccine for discrimination is legislation. We're going to administer it so that our state can build back better for all Michiganders. We'll continue taking steps forward and pass laws to protect our LGBTQ brothers and sisters because it's the right thing to do. Because it isn't just good for our people, it's good for our economy. Um, help us lure talent in from all over the world. In 2021, it's time for us to finally get Michigan on the right side of history. And so now it's my privilege to pass the mic back to Senator Moss, the lead Senate sponsor of the bill. So take it away, Jeremy. Thank you, Governor. I really appreciate you joining us in this fight time and time again. And more than 40 years ago, Democratic Rep Daisy Elliott and Republican Rep Mel Larson came together to create a Civil Rights Act in Michigan that states the opportunity to obtain employment, housing and other real estate, and the full and equal utilization of public accommodations, public service, and educational facilities without discrimination because of religion, race, color, national origin, age, sex, height, weight, familial status or marital status is recognized and declared to be a civil right. So if someone is discriminated in employment, housing or publicly available services here in Michigan, and they have proof that their status in one of those protected classes is the reason for this discrimination, they can submit that evidence to the Civil Rights Commission and it will investigate that claim. And this act has curbed instances of discrimination against these protected classes for more than 40 years. And for 40 years, there has been an effort to add sexual orientation and gender identity among those existing protected classes. And while a Supreme Court ruling from last year did extend federal employment protections to LGBTQ people from a conservative court, no less, today, we are reintroducing our efforts to extend Elliot Larson workplace, housing, and public accommodation protections to the LGBT community here in Michigan. This is a document of my values as a gay person. And I also believe that this is a document of Michigan values too, of decency, of kindness, of respect toward one another. If you would not fire someone or evict someone or deny them services because they are LGBTQ, then this is your values statement too. It requires nothing more of you. And as I have been able to provide the space during my six plus years in the legislature for countless thoughtful, engaging and enlightening conversations with many people in the legislature, including those across the aisle, some of them having this conversation for the first time on this issue, we are finding growing support for our efforts. It was Harvey Milk who said, coming out is the most political thing you can do. Come out to your parents, relatives, friends, neighbors, coworkers, where you shop and where you eat to break down the myths, destroy the lies and distortions for your sake and for their sake. And that's exactly what representatives Pahutsky and Sneller and I have done. And as a result, we have legislation that is supported by Democrats, by regional leaders in the state, by both labor and the business community. And for the first time, Republicans in the House and Senate. Just like that original act drafted by representatives Elliott and Larson all those years ago, this is a bipartisan effort. So for more, I'll turn it over to my partner in the House, Representative Pahotsky. Thank you, Senator Moss, and thank you, Governor Whitmer. And thank you to everyone for joining us this morning to discuss this truly crucial piece of legislation. As has been explained for years now, Expanding the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act is not a partisan issue. The majority of Michiganders support expanding protections around sexual orientation and gender identity. The governor already mentioned this. We're going to hear from Aaron Knott in a few minutes who will expand on this part a little more, but businesses all across our state have repeatedly declared the expansion would benefit our economy. In the lead up to this press conference, we received statements of support from people and organizations who had never before weighed in, but felt compelled to now. And for the first time, as Senator Moss mentioned, these bills have bipartisan support in both the House and Senate chambers, 
providing a clear path forward to enact this legislation. The landscape has changed profoundly between this press conference and previous ones regarding the same issue. The LGBTQ plus community has been afforded some protections that were previously not in place and that progress should not be understated. However, there are gaps that still exist and these bills offer a bipartisan path for the legislature to address them immediately. It's 2021. We have been battling a pandemic that has been indiscriminate as it has devastating for a year now. And during that time, we have all relied upon each other to get us through this crisis. And we're going to have to continue to rely on one another to rebuild our economy as we recover. And if there is anything that we have learned through this time, it's that when our backs are against the wall, it doesn't matter who the person fighting beside you loves or what their gender identity is. It does matter though, when those same characteristics are used to deny them housing or public services. It is long, long overdue that we expand the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act and ensure that all Michiganders are protected from discrimination. So thank you. And I am now going to hand things over to Sarah from the Human Rights Commission. Thank you so much, Governor Whitner, uh, Senator Moss, Representative Pahatsky. You know, incredible progress has been made for the rights of LGBTQ people at the federal level. Last June, the Supreme Court affirmed that federal sex non-discrimination protections apply to LGBTQ people. And just over six weeks ago, the president signed an executive order implementing um, the Bostock decision instructing federal agencies to apply the decision across the federal government. But this does not, progress does not negate the need for Michigan to in effect apply the Bostock decision to state law, which is exactly what this legislation would do. Amending the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act to explicitly include sexual orientation and gender identity will guarantee non-discrimination protections. Everyone should have the ability to seek remedy under state law. The state civil rights commission and state courts are often more expeditious and cheaper, both for the person bringing a claim and for the defendant. Michigan law also protects a greater number of people, thus including LGBTQ individuals is both common sense and fair. It's time for Michigan to recognize the full dignity and worth of our LGBTQ neighbors, coworkers, family, and friends. With that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Erin Knott. Good morning. Uh, it's fantastic opportunity to be with you all here today. I'd want to personally thank Senator Moss and Representative Pahutsky for their leadership and willingness to do the heavy work on behalf of the LGBTQ community. I also want to thank the governor. Since day one, you've been a staunch champion for equality. Your words have met with real action. And personally, I want to thank you for doing everything possible for the last year to keep me and my family, my family, excuse me, safe. So thank you. Unfortunately, the Michigan legislature is the last place where bias is accepted. For 38 years, the legislature has refused to prohibit discrimination of LGBTQ people. Michigan is an uncompetitive outlier, but local chambers, employers like Steelcase, Herman Miller, Dow, and even the Amway Corporation all understand is that in the war for talent, highly educated and skilled workers who are LGBTQ or who have LGBTQ family members can vote with their feet putting businesses that operate in cities and states without non-discrimination protections are at a comparative disadvantage. And let me be clear, employment non-discrimination is not enough on its own because workers and their families live and participate in their communities. They need to know that they can seek housing and go about their daily lives without the fear of discrimination based on who they are and who they love. In May, 2018, Equality Michigan initiated unprecedented action pre-Bostock that resulted in the Michigan Civil Rights Commission interpreting Michigan's existing prohibition on sex discrimination to encompass discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. We have done everything that can be done in absence of this legislation. The recent controversy involving an economic development agency in Southwest Michigan should be considered a lightning rod, a wake up call for lawmakers who have long vilified the LGBTQ community. We will no longer tolerate the license to discriminate, citing faith. Lawmakers thinking about opposing equality must think differently or they run the risk of being unemployable when they are termed out of office. 
lawmakers who have refused to take action for equal rights have one final opportunity to be on the right side of history. We have today's legislation that's being introduced. Again, thank you, Senator Moss and Representative Pohutsky. And we also, have, we also have the citizen signatures. Time is running out. Here's the bottom line. Fighting back against discrimination takes tenacity and strength. I'm honored to be joining with strong leaders who will hold the line with me and who will not support a license to discriminate because Michigan is better than this. We will not pass legislation with a carve out or exemption. We will not make Michigan, Indiana. And with that, last but not least, it's my honor to introduce Janice Pointdexter. Good morning, everyone. Again, thank you all for sharing space and gathering. I feel so honored and privileged to be in the company of such leaders um, that I also have the joy of knowing personally. Um, this, is a, this is a safe space for us all to arrive. And this is how it should feel for all Michiganders, particularly LGBTQ community members. They should know that they too are deserving of neighbors. They should know that they too are deserving of a life that exemplifies the character of who they are. And whatever that is and whichever they arrive, they should feel comfortable doing so. Know that they won't be met with harm violence and um, rhetoric that can also incite violence. So again, we all name mine in the same love, in the same uh, um, need and want for progress, fully understanding the importance of making Michigan more equitable. We all throw around conversations about diversity and inclusion. Um, but what we are seeking is a more equitable investment into our futures, into our homes, into our families, into our chosen families. All those things are important and they all come with us. The annual flag raising is beautifully, um, you know, executed every year and it's ceremonial. But what comes after that is still the violence, is still the marginalization, is still the hurt and the pain. So we still have so much work to do. Um, I'll echo many statements. It's been almost 40 years since the state of Michigan has made a Michigan for everyone and even really taken up the idea of doing so. Um, and as, as the case manager for Ruth Ellis, um, I see the effects of that pain and that violence. Also, as the Vice President of Trans Sisters of Color Project and being a trans, a proud trans woman of color, a black trans woman, um, we're at the totem pole, the end of the totem pole when it comes to respect and inclusion and, and real equitable interests. And so all of these ideas have come together and all of these leaders have come together to again, say no more, to again, put forth a, a collective solid effort um, I'm very thrilled to also be the co-chair of the Fair and Equal Michigan Initiative, where we just turned in over 483,000 signatures, which signifies the support of Michiganders all around saying that this is necessary and that the time is now. I thank you, stay safe, stay loving, stay with your families, and remember, fights aren't easy and you aren't guaranteed the outcome. But if you don't fight, who will? Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our speakers uh, for sharing their stories today and their action on this important issue. We will now take questions. Uh, please indicate that you have a question by raising your hand. I see that we already have a couple, so I'll get to you in order that you raise your hand. I know that the governor is off to her next engagement. So if you have a question for our panelists who are still on, we're happy to take those now. Um, when I call on you, please uh, say your name and your outlet and um, to whom your question is directed. So we will start with Tim Skubik. Tim, we're gonna unmute you and you can go ahead. Thank you. Senator, uh, you, you talked about your bipartisan support. Could you put some numbers on that for us? How many Republican senators do you have on board? How many Repu uh, Republicans members in the House do you have on board? 
So I can speak for the Senate package, Tim. Uh, so we have all 16 Senate Democrats and Senator Wayne Schmidt as the very first Republican co-sponsor of this effort. But as you know, in a 36 member state Senate, which is where we are right now, uh, if we were able to find the 18th uh, vote for this uh, for this measure, and with Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist breaking an 18-18 tie, it would pass in the state Senate. And I can tell you, Tim, with absolute confidence, we have the 18th vote. We probably have even the 19th or 20th vote. Uh, so I whipped. Uh, I know that if it were put up for a vote in the state Senate today, that it would pass. Uh, and that is displayed by the fact that a member of the Republican caucus uh, felt confident to sign on to this effort. And in the Michigan House, then, Representative? Uh, the Republican that co-sponsored was uh, Representative Tommy Brand, who has previously been supportive of, of the, this legislation. Uh, same as Senator Moss, there were Republicans that I spoke to who were uh, willing to vote for it, uh, did not necessarily want to co-sponsor, but were willing to vote for it. We would be able to get it through the House as well if it were to come up for a vote. So we have multiple paths forward with this legislation. The fact that they don't want to co-sponsor, what does that say to you? You know, unfortunately, as much as we've talked about this being a nonpartisan or bipartisan issue, uh, there is still a stigma that this is a, a democratic issue. And uh, there are representatives on both sides of the aisle who have a personal stake in this, obviously, uh, but are concerned that this is a democratic issue. Um, so I think that you know, there, there is legislation of, of all manners that you are supportive of, but don't necessarily want to co-sponsor. Um, you know, that's certainly been the case for me. I imagine it's been the same for the Senator as well. So I think that this is uh, something that we're, we're shifting the perspective on, but there are still some that are still clinging to the issue, the, the thought that this is a, a democratic issue. And I'll add too that this is the time for reckoning for a few reasons. Number one, we have Republican co-sponsors now in the House and Senate. So I think it's going to give people who have never put their name on the paper before a chance to reevaluate their position. That's number one. And number two, uh, we're going to have to deal with this in the legislature in one way, shape, or form, either by legislation or by the petitions that are coming to us. And so that ballot proposal can come up to the legislature for a vote. Uh, and we can all put our voice on record there uh, to just support the ballot proposal and be done with this uh, endeavor and, and secure LGBTQ rights. Um, so this is, this is, this is the moment uh, for those who have decided not to sign on but are open to supporting the issue uh, to learn more. And we're giving them that space to do so. And to build on the senator's point, there were Republicans who, who specifically mentioned the, the ballot proposal and the fact that, you know, as the senator mentioned, there is going to be a reckoning on this. It is going to be taken up one way or another. At this point, it's a choose your own adventure with the legislature, to be quite honest. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Tim. Next, we're going to go to Steve Culver. Steve, we're going to unmute you and you can go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you. I have two questions for uh, the Senator. Uh, Senator Moss, um, in light of the new interpretation by some local and federal courts of the definition of the word gender, is the term gender identity and expression still part of the language of this legislation? So it's the interpretation of sex. So the Supreme Court uh, has ruled and the Michigan Department of Civil Rights has interpreted that sex discrimination would include discrimination uh, based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and we support that, uh, absolutely. But that, that is a capture in time subjected to a potential future capture in time. Uh, it's subjected to a future court ruling. It's subjected to a future interpretation from the Department of Civil Rights. So what we're trying to do here today is leave no question, leave no doubt that these protected classes, sexual orientation and gender identity are written into the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act. So we support that interpretation, uh, but we wanna leave no question whatsoever uh, for future action that these are protected classes here in Michigan. And if there's a violation of the Elliott, Civil, uh, Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, they have the ability to take their claim to the Civil Rights Commission based on that. Uh, thank you. And then, Senator, uh, before the recent controversy erupted over former House Speaker Lee Chatfield, you actually congratulated him on his new employment. Uh, can you speak to the fine line you walk in Lansing in trying to work with and educate your colleagues and the idea of accountability of those that would oppose uh, LGBT rights? 
That's a really good question. Um, and we've been talking a lot in that space of how far can you reach out uh, before you realize that certain people may not have your best interests at heart. Uh, but the reality is, is, you know, I, I have, uh, I serve and I have served six years in a Republican controlled legislature. And while I have pushed for uh, a democratic majority to ensure that this would have an easier path to pass every election cycle, we're still in a Republican led legislature. So to pass anything in a Republican led legislature, you need Republican support. Uh, so I have been open uh, to having these conversations across the aisle because when I uh, came into the Michigan House of Representatives, there were no LGBT members uh, of the House of Representatives uh, to carry on this discussion across the aisle. And then when I came into the Senate, there were no LGBTQ senators. Uh, so I've taken it upon myself, of course, to educate, to listen, to hear concerns, um, and to give space for people to change their minds. Because up until the last several years, this, as Representative Pahutsky mentioned, was not a bipartisan effort. And the fact is, is that every Republican uh, needs the space to change their mind in order to get on board with these issues. And that's why I've extended an olive branch to have these conversations, including with Lee Chatfield. And we have talked about this over the course of the six years that we served in the legislature together. And I will tell you, uh, he came a long way from the 2014 candidate uh, to where he was. But ultimately, of course, the best time to have supported uh, Elliot Larson was when he was in the legislature. So I'm still there, Representative Pahutsky is still there, and we are still on this mission to have these conversations uh, because as Republicans have, who have never weighed in on this issue before, it's gonna require changed minds in order to gain their support. And that's proven here today that we've put in the work to earn Republican support on this. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now we're going to go on to Dave with the Free Press. Dave, we're going to mute, unmute you and you can go ahead. Hi, thank you uh, for doing this today. I, I appreciate it. Uh, Senator and Representative, I know you both said you think you have the votes if it goes to a vote in the full House or Senate, but can you speak to any feedback or conversations you've had with Republican leadership in either chamber about like just the logistical chances of the bill even coming up in committee or making it to a full vote in the House or Senate? You know, I, I think that it's um, leadership has been a little bit more tight lipped about it, obviously, uh, but to everyone's point, this is going to be dealt with one way or another. So there, there are only, you know, so many options or uh, opportunities for, for people to remain quiet on this. Um, we, we can, you know, take it upon ourselves to pass these bills. We can deal with the, the ballot initiative. That's up to leadership. Uh, but this is going to be dealt with. And to Aaron Knott's point, uh, what we have seen is that there are long-term ramifications in the era of term limits for what you choose to take up or not take up. Um, you know, as, as the Senator mentioned, I, you know, there is a fine line to be walked between being a, a queer woman in the legislature uh, who, you know, is just trying to convince people that we should all have the same rights as everybody else and just trying to uh, navigate a GOP led legislature. But the fact of the matter is, this is going to have to be dealt with. Uh, so I don't really interpret leadership's silence in, in the wake of these bill introductions um, as an unwillingness, but that's also because they, they don't really have the, the choice to not take it up. It is going to have to be taken up one way or another. Yeah, and I would just echo, uh, you know, uh, there is a reckoning coming on this and uh, we can either pass the ballot proposal as introduced, we could pass the legislation as introduced, or we could go to the public and public support for this far exceeds the leadership of the state Senate or State House of Representatives. Um, so I, I will leave that up to Senator Shirky on which path to choose, uh, but, but I would bet that we are in the last throes of this effort. Uh, and so it's really a call to action for those on the other side, either join us on this effort uh, and, and better understand what we're trying to achieve here or don't, but at the same time, we're not advocating uh, for the, 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 the membership of the Senate or the House of Representatives to be heard. We're advocating for the state of Michigan and public support to be heard on this. 
Yeah, I I love to echo Senator Moss's Senator Moss's uh, sentiment. Um, we are no longer asking for permission to have respect of our lives and to be recognized as human beings. It's, it's far long gone from that. I remember over a year ago, sitting up in private offices and private meetings, um, and I was literally told that the efforts of the Fair and Equal Michigan Initiative would not go anywhere. We would not raise the money. We would not get the signatures. It was literally dead on arrival. And here we are over a year later with more than enough signatures, with more than enough support, all of the big three um, national businesses weighing in saying the importance of passing this and making sure that all Michiganders feel safe. So again, we are not axing. We are pushing forward and either you want to join us or you don't, but we're going. Great, our next question comes from Allison Donahue. Allison, we're going to unmute you and you can go ahead. Hi, thanks. Um, so can you fill me in on the status of the ballot drive? I know that you said that the signatures are there, but what are the next steps and how are we feeling about it as of right now? Um, the, well, we feel good about it as an entity um, because like I said, all of the hurdles and roadblocks that were set before us, um, as far as the support, as far as what we really needed to do over a year ago, we literally were told to our faces that we needed to concentrate on flipping the Senate seats and yada, 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 yada. We know, we all know the kind of jargon about what's important and what's not. Um, but we focused, um, even throughout the pandemic, we pushed through. We were one of the first initiatives to have um, the e-signing where we could collect signatures online so it wouldn't stifle the effort. And each hurdle, each time, whether it be money, the process, whatever it was that it was put before us, not only did we meet it, but we kept going and kept going just like the en little engine that could. And so we are very excited. We are very encouraged. We continue to have um, private meetings um, with people, you know, just advocating so they can fully understand with the, engaging with the business community and different sectors. Um, so like I said earlier, we're pushing forward and we feel very good that all of Michiganders will celebrate this success. And logistically speaking, and every I amen to everything Janice <laughs> always does. Uh, but logistically speaking, you know, I, I, I use this term that my dear friend and former colleague and advocate in this case, John Hoadley, used to say, this is an all of the above approach. Uh, and so in terms of the ballot uh, petitions, so uh, Fair and Equal Michigan submitted the signatures. They're awaiting certification from the Secretary of State. And once they get that certification, the legislature has the ability to act. The legislature could take an up or down vote in that moment to put that proposal into law. Uh, and uh, if it chooses not to, then it will go to the ballot where the public supports this issue far and above beyond uh, where members of the legislature are. So it's an all of the above approach. We're introducing legislation. There's a ballot proposal. The legislature could adopt either. The legislature could kick it to a vote of the public and then that would uh, hopefully achieve LGBTQ rights. Um, so you have all of these different groups in different spaces working toward the same goal. Uh, and uh, we're, we're offering this legislation as an avenue as well. And you mentioned that there's support from the public and there's support from various business groups, but why won't these business groups that support the ballot measure or support the legislation push the GOP legislature to take action? I'm with you on that. Uh, that, that, is, that is a question into open space that I would love the answer for as well. Um, and, and, I've, and I've had those conversations, um, but you know, th th there, there's a reckoning for them as well. Um, because this is an opportunity to really display that you don't just support these endeavors in words, you support them in action. Thank you. Great. We are just at about 30 minutes. We've got a couple more uh, questions that we're able to take. So just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question to raise your hand. Uh, next, we have Rachel Louise Just. Rachel, we're going to unmute you and you can go ahead with your question. Hi, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to answer my question. I had two quick questions. First of all, I know Janice said that there was not support for this just a year ago. Now there is. 
What changed in the last year? Um, does it have anything to do with our new uh, president or is it just an atmospheric change? And then also, um, you, you both have, you have all said that the legislature can kick this to the public and the public support for this is quite strong. So why are we going through the legislature on this? Why don't we just kick it over to the public and make sure we know it's gonna pass? I'll take up the first part and I'll allow one of our elected officials to follow up with the second part. Um, what changed is, um, let's just be very clear, just because we have uh, members who identify with the community, um, that doesn't mean we had all of their support. Um, there was quiet rumblings about um, just being totally transparent about there being no, um, no interest or inclusion of people of color, particularly black, particularly trans women. And so um, with me coming on as co-chair, obviously, you know, that kind of attack, that kind of uh, uh, rhetoric, if you will. And it wasn't something that was done, um, you know, out of being calculated. Um, my, my other co-chairs just asked me if I would because they saw the passion and the know-how. And so when you ask what's changed, um, just the focus and the drive, um, because we know the time is now. I cannot continue to go to my constituents and families of trans women, Black trans women that are being murdered in the streets every day and saying, oh, well, our state leadership doesn't want to value your life and don't think that you're important right now. So we just got to wait for another elective cycle. That won't work. And in terms of why approach it from uh, a legislative perspective when we have the ability, uh, why, why would we wait? As Janice just mentioned, um, this is happening every day to people. So yes, there are protections that were, are in existence now that were not the last time this press conference happened. Um, but that being said, there are still people who are being discriminated against because of the gaps in the existing protection. So That's why right. would we wait when we don't have to? Yes, the, the, the ballot uh, initiative is an option, but now we have this too. We could take this up this week if we chose to. And citing that all of the above approach, uh, there are many ways to tackle this, but specifically, the reason we're introducing legislation is because there are Republicans right now who are comfortable being on record in support of this. Uh, and we congratulate them, we welcome them, we thank them uh, for joining us on this effort. So when the ballot proposal does come to the legislature, it, provides, it perhaps provides an off-ramp for those who don't want to see this passed, but recognize that it would pass if brought up to a vote. Um, so it's just another option on the table to recognize uh, that uh, we don't necessarily have to go to the ballot on this if we can just pass it right through the legislature. Okay, our next question comes from Caitlin. Caitlin, you can go ahead. Hi, Caitlin Kibble from The Gander. I am wondering what kinds of people are in these gaps? What does passing this either legislatively or at the ballot box, what does that change for your constituents and your supporters for, um, for the groups on the call? I think this is a good space for HRC and Equality Michigan to weigh in uh, from a legal perspective of the Supreme Court ruling was important, but not all encompassing. So I'll, I'll kick it over to Sarah and Aaron. I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, this is, this is imperatively important that we take action immediately because depending on you know, where you work or where you live, you might find yourself not protected by our state civil rights law. And, and we know this and Sarah will echo and, and Janice is agreeing with me, the patchwork approach that we have here in Michigan, you know, nearly 40 plus municipalities, cities and townships have some form of a non-discrimination ordinance. But again, you shouldn't have to work for a particular company or an institution or live in a city like Kalamazoo where I am right now to know that you and your loved one are protected. And so we need to take this step. We need to codify this into the law because as Senator Moss said earlier, it just takes another court's decision or another interpretation by the Civil Rights Commission and we're rolling back. So the time is now to codify this, to explicitly protect um, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression without a carve out or exemption of any kind. 
And in addition to the gaps uh, you know, between jurisdictions that Aaron mentioned, there are also gaps between federal law and state law. Um, federal employment law applies to businesses with 15 or more full-time employees. Um, and Michigan's law is much stronger than that. It applies uh, to mid and smaller businesses as well. Um, and your uh, ability to receive protections to not uh, be turned away from a job, um, to not be fired, to not be denied um, your healthcare benefits, et cetera, shouldn't be dependent on whether you work for an employer with 15 employees or one with 10 employees. And so that's a really critical gap that the Michigan law fills. Um, in addition, you know, uh, our federal civil rights law and public accommodation just aren't what they need to be. They don't cover grocery stores and dry cleaners um, and people should be free from discrimination no matter where they go in their daily lives. Um, and Michigan really has a proud long tradition of providing exceptional um, civil rights laws. It's now just time to update it to include LGBTQ folks. Thank you, Sarah. We have one last question in the chat box here. Erica Murphy is asking, what's the timeline in getting this introduced and passed? Senator Moss, can you take that one? Yeah, so our, our bill is gonna be uh, enrolled tomorrow. It's Senate Bill 208 uh, in the Senate during session. Uh, Representative Pahutsky introduced hers a, a couple of weeks ago, and then it will be referred to committee. Uh, and we will push for a committee hearing. We will push for a vote. Uh, so, so these bills have been introduced uh, and, and the work on this uh, hopefully is imminent. Uh, but once those ballot petitions are certified, there is a window where we have to act on it or it goes to the ballot. Um, so this is coming. This is, this is coming uh, for a decision from the legislature one way or another. Pass it, send it to the ballot, whatever, very soon. Uh, I don't know if Rep Podsky wants to weigh in more on that. No, you covered it. I mean, that's that's the timeline. Uh, it, it, at this point, uh, we're just hoping for a hearing and working to get those. So yeah, I, I believe we were told it's forty days um, for a, a vote to, or a decision to be made. So I believe that's what the window um, that Senator Moss was speaking of. Okay. I'm not seeing any more questions. So with that, we'll conclude our program today. Again, thank you for everyone for speaking and for joining us and asking questions. Um, if you have any further questions, reporters, you know how to reach me. Um, again, I'm Rosie Jones with the Senate Democrats. Um, and if you'd like to talk with, more with any of our panelists today, reach out to me and I can connect you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. God bless. Thank you all.